Last week, the Knights carved up Cronulla at Tamworth, heralding a big claim for a share of the $200,000 prize money on offer. Ashley Gordon stepping out for his genuine first grade debut was in brilliant form, scoring two tries and consistently backing up. Yeah, well, Ashley has great anticipation and uh, he's a sort of player that uh, he also has very good instincts and uh, he certainly knows how to back those instincts. One of the unsung heroes of last week's game was Jeff Doyle. Doyle showed the touch that he finished the season with last year, busting through lines of defence to get away try-setting passes. However, while the stars shone, there was plenty of rivalry between halfback Steve Fulmer and Steve Walters, a rivalry that coach Alan McMahon says is healthy. It's a very close contest between both of them and, uh, you know, irrespective of who gets the nod or, you know what I mean, for whatever game, you know, they know that there's a fellow behind them equally as good. So that's a tremendous position for the Knights to be in, to have two guys as, as sort of like, you know, competitive and contestant the way they are. Coach McMahon has named a 21-man squad for the game against Norths and will eliminate three from the side after training on Friday night. NBN will bring you the quarter-final game from Goulburn on Sunday night at 10.30. In the wake of the earthquake, Newcastle has seen many events staged to raise money for earthquake relief. Some of Australia's biggest music names have pulled their time and talent over the last few weeks and lent their support through benefit concerts in both Sydney and Newcastle. Tonight's concert will be an unrivalled treat for Newcastle's opera followers, with performers from the Australian Opera donating their time for a cause they see as a national concern. And what can people expect when they come along tonight? Well, they can expect all the favourite um, arias, duets and trios from their favourite operas. Um, all the songs that you, and tunes that you recognise, but you're never quite sure which opera they come from. Ticket sales have been brisk and it is estimated $10,000 will be added to the Lord Mayor's Relief Fund. It's understood the property is attracting interest are Fanny's nightclub and the former Key One complex which includes the Windward Passage Tavern. Fanny's nightclub closed in mid-1989 while the Windward Passage lasted a short while longer. Since then the properties have languished in an indifferent market until a sudden increase in inquiries over the past month. Colin Chapman Real Estate is the agent for both sites, but a spokesman for the firm was reluctant to comment on the progress of negotiations. It's estimated the two properties have a combined value in excess of $3 million. Two prospective buyers are involved. One plans to revive Fanny's as a nightclub, while Key One could emerge with a surprisingly different role. Meanwhile, another move in the hotel industry with the arrival of Carlton Draft Beer on tap at a local hotel. It's understood Carlton is trialling its draft beer in a move to take on Tui's draft, which has dominated the hunter. A stock take by staff at S&W Miller revealed that thieves collected eight colour television sets and eight video cassette recorders with a total value of more than $6,000. Neighbours told police that a white van smashed into the rear of the store at about 4.30 this morning. The robbers took just minutes to load the goods before racing from the scene along Valencia Street. In their haste, they left several clues, among them a machete, which detectives say indicates how determined the culprits were to avoid interference. A number of tyre tracks were also photographed by scientific police. Detectives say they've been given important information by local residents, but more information would help. We'd uh, particularly like to hear from any member of the public who may have seen a, uh, a Toyota Hiace or a similar type of vehicle in the area around Mayfield, uh, the vicinity of the uh, uh, s Miller premises. 
The vehicle's registration number is believed to be OWL 634. Meanwhile, in an unrelated matter, Mayfield detectives have charged a 42-year-old unemployed Glendale man with the theft of brass axle bearings from historic coal hoppers near Hexham. About 200 bearings, each weighing several kilos, were taken from the wagons over the past two months. The 60-year-old hoppers were on permanent lease from Coal and Allied to the Richmond Vale Preservation Society. Detectives have recovered about half the missing blocks, but they expect to find more. The man is charged with four counts of theft. He will appear in Newcastle Court on March 27. Industrial switchgear began as a small operation in 1971. The company made a policy of keeping abreast of technology and that culminated in today's invitation to its clients to see its latest acquisition at work. The Australian-made Laser Lab Contour aroused plenty of interest and no doubt not a little envy. The machine can cut through almost anything and with a beam a tenth of a millimetre thick, finishing off is usually unnecessary. What's uh, special about it is the uh, intri intricacy and the uh, fineness of cut that uh, the laser can produce with this type of material. Um, Have those edges been finished off? The edges haven't been touched, that's exactly how the uh, component comes off the laser. The laser is of course computer controlled. The desired shape is mapped out and any other information is entered. From there it's just a matter of pressing the cut button and the laser does the rest. It just keeps coming up with a challenge and you know, whatever you can draw on the CAD cam it'll cut out here. According to industrial switchgear the machine is one of just three in Australia. Although the outlay is significant for a company with a turnover of 10 million a year, Stephen Lang believes it will pay for itself in two years. A lot of work that uh, requires this sort of uh, fineness of cut, this sort of intricacy, goes to Sydney Market or even Melbourne now where the laser cutters are. And you'd like to capture that market? We'd like to capture that market by being the first and the hunter to bring a laser into the, this situation. Industrial Switchgear is a major subcontractor in the Ganin and Tangara train project. The laser will go some way towards earning its keep as it halves the time it takes to produce the complicated shapes. The under-21s game began furiously with both sides eager to take out some pre-season aggression in gang tackles. Norths were first to settle and set up a try through a blockbusting run from Simon McKinney who unloaded to Tony Moss before Paul Clarina was sent in for the easiest of tries. The Knights didn't take long letting the Bears know they weren't impressed. Players from both sides were keen to show their talents because a good performance today could mean a spot in either club's SG ball or under 21 sides. However, the Knights just couldn't click and let each other's hard running down with sloppy ball work, letting the Bears run out winners 4-0. At Birmingham Gardens this afternoon and the Newcastle Australs got their season underway in stylish fashion with a 2-1 win over Polonia. The Australs wasted no time in raiding the Polonian goal striking within the first minute of play. Only a divot in the wet ground sending the ball off target. Polonia worked hard in the Austral's half but couldn't break the locals' defence. An interference call in front of goal gave Austral's the chance to get ahead but Polonia felt secure their wall wouldn't be penetrated. Then with only minutes remaining in the first half Austral's notched up their first goal off the boot of Simon Brandt. Budgie Woy was far enough away to escape serious damage, but certainly close enough to feel the full power of December's quake. 
I mean, we're only really 40 minutes from Newcastle, and we were sitting in the clubhouse, and we thought that the power station had blown up when it happened. We felt it here, the whole clubhouse just shook. The Budgie Woy Soccer Club has recently entered the Newcastle competition and that prompted club officials to organise the concert to help boost the quake relief coffers. This was actually the event's last chance. Twice previously it was rained out. Today the showers threatened but stayed away and the bands finally got to play. Organisers expect the concert to raise several thousand dollars through gate takings and donations. Mary Jane Pinkham's childhood is part of an era of exploration and sailing ships most of us only know from history books. She's seen in 105 birthdays, the latest today in the Kalani nursing village. After 104 renditions, the words of the old song must certainly have a familiar ring. Mrs Pinkham was born in South Australia before eventually settling at the entrance. She's outlived five of her children, the other two were there today. She also boasts five grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren and five great-greats, an achievement certainly warranting some very far-flung attention. Buckingham Palace, to Mary Pinkham, I am most interested to hear that you are celebrated your 105th birthday and send you my warm congratulations and good wishes on reaching this remarkable age. Elizabeth R. The bandits, clad in balaclavas and dark clothing, burst into the club as staff were clearing up after a Sunday night disco. Three employees were forced at gunpoint into a front office. The thieves then emptied cash registers behind the bar and ransacked the day safe. The main safe, holding far more cash, was left undisturbed, with the intruders unable to break the combination. This morning, detectives interviewed staff in an effort to piece together last night's events. With no sign of forced entry, it seems the bandits may have walked through an open door. Uh, we understand at this stage that uh, two people left the club, two employees left the club and didn't shut the door behind them, or didn't lock the door behind them, and the thieves entered through the front door. Shaken but unharmed, the club employees were locked up for 40 minutes before they raised the alarm. The three heard no sound of a departing car, leading police to believe the bandits may have escaped on foot across the golf course, possibly to a waiting car. Well, the first offender was uh, about five foot ten, a very solid build, um, a mature voice. He was very calm throughout the robbery. Uh, he was armed with a handgun. The second offender was a very slight build, about uh, five foot nine, and he was armed with a bolt action rifle. For the moment, police investigations are centering on interviewing more than 50 patrons at last night's disco. Leslie Robinson, NBN News. On the launching pad at Carrington Slipways this morning, the David Allen looked every bit the $11.6 million vessel that maritime authorities claim has the technology to change the face, or rather the floor, of Newcastle Harbour. Able to dredge to 72 metres, one of the ship's key features is its computer, which is actually capable of scanning the ocean floor. But despite its state-of-the-art equipment, the David Allen's name is steeped in history, having been named after Newcastle's longest-serving harbour master, Captain David Tate Allen, who served for 26 years from 1858. Today, State Family and Community Services Minister Virginia Chadwick gave the ship her blessing before sending it on its way. A picture-perfect launch that brought hearty applause and cheers from onlookers. But there was no time for admiration. The David Allen was quickly towed to another berth where final fitting and testing will be carried out. 
And as fate would have it, the launch of the David Allen could not possibly have been more timely. As a result of the recent heavy rains, hundreds of thousands of tonnes of soil has washed into Newcastle Harbour from swollen Hunter rivers, greatly reducing its depth and therefore its productivity. Uh, after the flooding rains of two weeks ago, we've got a draft restriction of one uh, or half a metre, I should say. And that represents something in the order of 3,000 tonnes per large coal vessel of restricted lift. That can equate to something like $120,000 to $200,000 uh, per vessel visit in terms of coal value and freight rates. You add up the number of vessels, of the 1,000 vessels that come to the port a year, it's clear you need the depth. The David Allen is expected to be ready to tackle the problem within eight weeks, but it seems its technology won't be given exclusively to Newcastle. Plans have been made to use it in other commercial ports throughout the state, with a vessel expected to attract lucrative hire rates. Walters was sent from the field after this tackle on North's Jason Mitchell during the last quarter of yesterday's Challenge Cup game in Goulburn. The Knights will take in slow motion replays of the tackle showing Walters arm coming into contact with Mitchell as he tried to step. Knights officials are confident Walters clean record will stand him in good stead and he will escape with only a caution. The other Knight vying for the position of halfback Steve Fulmer also may be under a cloud after he was carried from the field compliments of a North Sydney knee. Coach Alan McMahon says he's now gone from the happy position of two exceptional players competing for the one spot to the possibility of losing both. Steve certainly it was a, a, defen a defensive decision that he needed to make fairly quickly and uh, keeping in mind that he, he's gone for stop the man with the football you know and Steve's taken a, um, a nasty knock to the to the side of his forehead which is which, which knocked him unconscious and uh, he's a tough little customer so it had to be a, a pretty king size knock to get him unconscious so uh, yeah you know that does look a bit different from this time say seven days ago. Despite the absence of the two Steves coach McMahon says the team let themselves down in the last quarter. Our ball control certainly needed a lot to be uh, desired in certain areas didn't we where we kept giving them a chance where we really didn't need to but uh, you know the guys would be critical of themselves about that as well, so that, they'd know that. With the elimination of the Knights from the pre-season comp, officials are now trying to schedule a number of trial games with other Sydney clubs before the competition proper. Lavender Cottage was opened today by the Mayor of Gosford, Alderman Kim Margin. It will provide care for the confused age, victims of Alzheimer's disease and its related disorders. We realised that there were many, many people in a home situation being cared for by sons and daughters uh, who had to go to work and do all those things that you and I have got to do, Alison, uh, and had nowhere to put mum and dad on that day they wanted to go out. So Matron had the concept uh, born about oh, five, six months ago now that we should extend our activities into a day-to-day -day type care situation. That's how Lavender Cottage, Cottage come about. Until now, the only centres catering to the confused age were limited to one or two days of care per week. Lavender Cottage has facilities to care for up to 12 people five days a week. At home, the folk are living, they've got their family looking after them. Um, they're looking after them seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That makes the carer a very, very tired person. Whereas here, we've got them for a shorter period. We can help motivate them a little bit more than what the family may be able to do. We wouldn't even try to say that they're going to get better care here because they won't get better care here. Their family and their home is what it's all about. We just hope to make this an extended part of their home. Newcastle earthquake has affected many people's lives, some in a little way, some a lot. The same human emotion is felt in varying degrees when a loved one dies, a family home is demolished, or a person's business or livelihood is suddenly interrupted. A special seminar held in Newcastle City Hall today dealt with the emotional aftermath of the earthquake. Leading the discussion was Robert Hockley from the National Association for Loss and Grief, an organisation established after the Granville train disaster. 
Well, this is a natural disaster where, as distinct from a man-made disaster, where people um, don't really have any focus for uh, their, their resentment or their anger. Uh, it's very difficult to blame anybody. It's more difficult. Uh, it's happened to everybody. Everybody's experienced it at the same time of day. It can all be dated back to, what was it, the 28th of December at 10.27. And uh, as we've talked with people just this afternoon, they've said that it's very uh, difficult to get the normal support that we get from one another because everybody's been affected by it. What are the normal kinds of human reactions after a disaster like an earthquake? I think of it in terms of grief, that people are shocked and numbed. They're also, uh, as the days go on, uh, upset at being, well, it's a sense of being assaulted. Is it natural as part of the, the coping process to want to just get on and fix things up, or is grieving an essential part? Well, I think... Uh, while the home is uh, still in need of repair, it's probably a, a constant frustration uh, and inconvenience, and the sooner it's fixed, the better. Uh, I would uh, be wanting to uh, deal with both the material adjustment that's necessary and the emotional adjustment. With grief, uh, the only way to get over it is to go through it. There's no way around. How would you compare Newcastle's reaction to this disaster to others that have occurred around Australia? There happens to be in Newcastle a very wide range of people who are very aware of the grief experience and of the management of disaster. And so we're seeing here, I suspect, one of the best resourced uh, disasters at a human level uh, that, that, that we've seen ever. Rumours over the changes to services from March the 11th have been rife throughout the Thornton, Tarrow and Sandgate areas. So tonight was City Rail's chance to put the record straight. Though the Thornton Progress Association realises weekday commuter services will be dramatically improved by express services, they have many other concerns. At nights and on weekends they'll get a, a worse service because the trains are going to be put back to every 90 minutes and some services at night which are now hourly, the two services will be made in one and there'll be a 90 minute wait. For the person who well, like goes to Hexham to work, they're going to be severely disadvantaged or into High Street towards Maitland or East Maitland. Again, they're going to be disadvantaged. Another problem is the state of local stations, which residents say is making life difficult for rail travellers. Here at Thornton, the platform and ramp are difficult to walk along. And at nearby Taro, one platform is a narrow wooden structure and there's little in the way of passenger comforts. Residents fear that changes to the timetable will mean fewer people use the trains, eventually leading to more cutbacks. But City Rail says careful monitoring will be done and services will match demand. All residents, it doesn't matter what area, they're all concerned about rail getting out of the business. If the people are prepared to use the business, the service will be there. But if they're not prepared to use the business, the service won't be there. And this is the first stage of tailoring services to match that demand that's there now.